form, you're all familiar. I updated this form, I, mean, not, I put in these two boxes so that your, um, your uh, clinical instructor will be signing. So the, for the weekly, you're gonna be uploading it. For the final exam, your clinical instructor is gonna be uploading it. So I know we all started, like we're already having the signatures, that's okay. You don't have to have the box. The clinical instructor can sign anyway. But for your final exam, can you see this form? It's updated like 9-23-23. Can you print this for your final exam, please? Please, yeah, please, yeah, okay. So did everybody see it? Yeah, I don't want any um, anybody not to have it because, or you have it the old one. Because there is only one item that I uh, fixed it also because it was written twice. Is that clear? Otherwise nothing has changed. But like, please bring this copy. Does everybody see it, please? Yeah? Okay. So if you see the boxes, it means at least that, that that's the updated form. And then yeah, I suggest that you print it and put it in your binder because the students forget. And then so it's very like uneasy situation when you are going to have an exam. Oh, the teacher is deep there and then you don't have the, your checklist. It's a very uneasy um, situation because like every minute counts because you have 15 minutes to, to do it. And so I'm just giving you some hints and we don't have extra forms, we don't have printer, so it, it creates a lot of commotion. So just for the sake of your piece, please uh, print it, put it in your binder. Before you know, it's already like December or like we're gonna be starting the, the final exam for the practice it starts two weeks before the final exam of the return. So it's gonna be end of November in other words. And before you know, it's November. Okay, so this is only, I'm just kind of uh, telling you so you can have some peace and then not be in anxious mind. Okay guys, All right. thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, relatively, ear, nose, and throat, it's an easy chapter. How are you enjoying? Are you enjoying the systems? Now yeah. that we're doing the systems, like yeah. it's, 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 it's better, huh? So the eyes, um, yeah. And then the other thing is, I know like last week I checked we, have, we were behind with the lymph nodes. We did some lymph nodes in my class. So, and today, ophthalmology, ophthalmoscope, I didn't show last week, I'm gonna show this week. So the moral of the story, like it, it doesn't have to be strictly that skill that day. If you have missed it from the week before, you have to make it up. Does that make sense? Like there is that, that flexibility. Please like be self-driven. Like if you haven't done one a skill, you have to go after the, the teacher. Okay, show me, I'm, uh, I mean show me or like let me show you, I'm gonna be signing. So it has to be interactive. Does that make sense guys? I don't want you to be passive. You know like I learned from you, you learn from me. The lab has to be an interactive session and then so you have to knock the door. Teacher, teacher, teach me. Does that make sense? I will teach but like you, if you have needs, you have to ask, you have to pull me aside. Okay, so like it has to be, you have to be aggressive a little bit. Because at the end, if the time passes and you didn't master the skill, you, you missed the opportunity. Am I making sense, guys? So in the lab, there is nobody like knows everything. And then the skill takes forever, I mean not forever, like you know, multiple attempts to, uh, to so that you can master it. Is that clear? Are you enjoying the lab? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so don't feel like intimidated, that, that it's like, uh, with my group at least, like Professor Colin is very nice too. Right, and then I think the Professor Silva is very nice too. Professor Rapinia is nice too. Like, is everybody feeling good with their clinical instructors? Mm -hmm. Do you have established a good rapport? Mm -hmm. You know, and then the lab, you know, like you don't need to know everything. That's where you're learning. Is that okay, guys? Mm -hmm. And then if, even if there is a skill that you don't know, you can pull me like an office hour, I'll teach you again. Okay, guys, please. All right, very good. Yeah, because like last summer, I see that the student, the skill was like not that fine tuned and I'm very, uh, you know, like I don't want you to miss opportunity because like I'm here to teach you because like you are under my wing right now, like after December you're gone. Okay, so I don't see you anymore. Like, you know, I have to make the opportunity count because uh, this is very fast track. If the opportunity passed and you didn't learn, then you're gonna suffer later on. And why are you gonna suffer? There is a lot anyway to begin with. And top of it, 
if the uh, if the skill is not mastered, it's gonna it's gonna be complicated the future semesters. Does that make sense, guys? So pull me aside. I'll I'll teach you. I mean, the physical exam I love. <laughs> the skill. So, all right. And I'm I'm never tired of explaining. You know, so ask me, I will teach you. Okay. Okay, so ear, nose, and throat. All right, so, uh, so, all right. So now, last time, uh, for first things, did you bring that uh, uh, neuro, mm -hmm. the sheet, you know, that I had summarized it for the cranial nerves? And to start learning it, because like in the final exam, believe it or not, I'm asking 50 questions from that list. You know, so like, okay, so you already have like 50 questions in your pocket. 50 points in your pocket. Like, what, what else you want? I mean, what else you want? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like, how hard is this? Like, you know, like, study that. And I, on top of it, I summarized it. It's not that, like, you're going to take the book and then look for it. It's already there. It's already, and then I have colored it too. And so, like, okay, 50 questions. All right, so like, like 50 bucks in your pocket. Because like if you learn from that, uh, if you learn one sheet, you know, so, and so it's very important because those cranial nerves, uh, 100 years from now, they're not gonna change, all right? So, uh, so it's never gonna be outdated, so please learn it, okay? All right, guys. All right, so now, at the beginning, we learned the face, the head and neck. Two cranial nerves we learned there. Right? Which, one, which, one, which one were they? Five and seven. Remember, trigeminal and facial, we learned it with the face. With the head and neck, you know, we learned the trigeminal and then we learned the facial. Five and seven. So some cranial nerves are sensory, some cranial nerves are only motor, some cranial nerves are sensory and motor. Five and seven, they are sensory and motor, so they have both legs. All right, okay. One thing also, I'm gonna be asking, like in the test, okay, open your ears, because like I don't want any confusion, I don't want you to miss the question. All right, so let's say that, all right, so uh, you tested the patient and you said, puff your cheeks, uh, 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 frown, and then so you close the eyes and then you know you try to open the eyelid, and then so I'm asking like, which cranial nerve did you check? Okay, you have to put cranial number seven, right? And I'm gonna ask, is cranial nerve number seven motor, sensory, or both? All right, so at this moment, the one that you checked was motor, but the cranial nerve is both sensory and motor. Does that make sense? Yes. Did you open your ears? Mm -hmm. So you don't write motor, you write both. Am I making sense, guys? So I'm kind of clearly clarifying from now. So during the test, don't ask me. And then don't make it the wrong choice. Is that clear, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, so cranial nerve seven is both sensory and motor. It will never change, even though at, mom at that moment, you only tested the motor leg of the cranial nerve. Is this clear? Did everybody hear it? Yes, yeah, yes. please, okay, thank you. All right, so now, so cranial nerve number five and cranial number seven, they're married together, they work together, they're kind of on the face. All right, the trigeminal five motor, what is it? Okay, so the movement, the movement. This is temporal mandibular joint, temporal mandibular joint. So you're checking the smooth function of this joint, and then so the jaw opens, the jaw closes, the jaw moves right and left, this is cranial nerve number five motor, because it's movement. Is that clear, guys? Anything that you feel on your face, hot, cold, sharp, dull, anything on the face is cranial nerve number five sensory. Is that clear? Or it's number seven. Are you done? Okay, can you bring it? Thank you. So, all right, cranial nerve number seven goes to the tongue, all right? So, cranial nerve number seven, thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so it's your responsibility to sign, otherwise, Spencer, you didn't sign either. All right, so, now, so uh, the cranial nerve number seven, this is the tongue. If we cut the tongue into three, so this is one, two, three, this is the tip. So the taste, the taste of one and two is cranial nerve number seven, sensory. Is this clear, guys? So uh, number seven is the tongue, the taste. The tip and the middle of the tongue, we feel the taste by cranial number seven, the sensory. 
Here, the third part, which is the posterior, it is cranial nerve number nine sensory. Okay, guys, so this much about cranial number seven sensory. What is cranial nerve number seven motor? So it has to be movement, and then it has to be with the face. So remember, like, we started with the face, head and neck, all right, so, so the face, so what is the cranial number seven? A smile, frown, puff your cheeks. Okay, close your eyes, and I'm gonna try to open it. I can't open it. Make your lips firstly. And I'm gonna try to open it, and I cannot open it. But like if I have a stroke, and my cranial number seven is damaged, and if you're doing, the, you, you can open my mouth, because I don't have the strength. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so that's cranial number seven motor. So that one we learned three weeks ago. Last week with the eye, or two weeks, uh, the eyes we did it twice, the two weeks because of the test um, movement, that's okay. So, but last week with the eye we learned four cranial nerves. Cranial nerve number two, which is optic, it's only sensory. Sensory, it's only sensory. sensory. So it kind of connects us from the environment, takes it to the brain, that's it, it stops there. Does that make sense? All right, so that's the sensory part of it. Okay, now. And then, so we learned three cranial nerves that, that are connected to the eye, which are cranial number three, oculomotor, and then cranial number four, trochlear, cranial, cranial number six is abducens. So these three cranial nerves are motor. So they're responsible for the movement of the eye. So for the nerve to make a movement, motor is movement, MM. Motor, muscle movement, right? So MMM, motor, muscle movement. So these cranial nerves have to be attached to a muscle that is innervating the eye for the movement to happen. So I, I kind of, there was a slide with the muscle names, but I don't want you to learn the muscle names. It's not relevant, it's okay. Does that make sense? So the movement, so cranial number three, oculomotor. What is it responsible? Up and down. When you look up and down without moving your head, up and down, without moving your head, like the lid is gonna go up and down. So who does that oculomotor? motor? What are you testing? Lid lag, what is lid lag? Lid, the lid, is it lagging, is it late? It shouldn't be late, does that make sense? So like if you're looking up, the lid is open. If you're looking down, the lid has to close. So it shouldn't lag. What does lagging mean? It means that it's not closing, or it's, it's late. It's taking longer to close, all right? so. One reason, only one reason, there can be multiple reasons, thyroid eye disease, you know, like they're advertising on the TV because there is an eye drop. So thyroid eye disease, like you look up and then down, and then the eye doesn't close because in, uh, in we learned it, in hyperthyroidism, the eye is bulging out. And so because the eye is bulging out, the lid is not able to cover. That's only one disease that you're doing. There are other diseases that you can check with this also. Is this clear? All right, so, and then also the cranial number three, what do we check? Pupil constriction. So if you give light, the light is too much. What is the pupil gonna say? I'm gonna close the window. How is the pupil close the window? Like who is helping? Because pupil ciliary is the window. Body. Ciliary, body. ciliary body, ciliary body. Don't forget, ciliary body is the muscle and it's on the second level or it's layer. And then so it is responsible to open to close, to open the close. So the pupil is the window, but somebody has to open and close it. Is that clear, guys? So that's the other thing is the focus and accommodation. Cranial number three is responsible for focus and accommodation. The purpose, like if I'm saying, okay, follow my finger, I'm accommodating and focusing. But like when you are only like, the look to the tip of my finger and then I'm not moving, what am I doing? Focusing. Is this clear? And then cover and cover is like for confirmation that there is no strabismus. What is a strabismus? It focuses, but not simultaneously. Does that make sense? One eye focuses like, okay, the other eye is focusing there. All right, so they are able to focus, but not simultaneously. So what is it called in the lay person's uh, terminology? Lazy eye. So what do you do? The one that is like focusing correctly, you cover, so that the lazy one is gonna learn how to focus, right? Is that clear? Okay, Okay. very good. So this was all, what is it? Review, review. I'm, I, keep, I will keep reviewing it so that like it will imprint into your head because like with repetition you learn, all right? So now, so yes. For cranial nerve four, um, 
I, is that one also accommodating like when when you're bringing an object in and out no just like learn the tree is accommodating okay all right no. okay so like don't be confused for the th three four and six we're going to be using it for the eoms extraocular movements okay okay all right so now we learned already uh, six today we're going to be learning number another cranial nerve so seven cranial nerves today we're going to finish so out of the 12 today we know seven is that clear last week we knew six today we're going to learn seven yes what was the movement for six is it lateral yeah so just like no the the in the six like it's lateral so kind of the four and the six one uh, so they're they're doing different directions mm -hmm. okay so just consider them within the eoms huh just consider four and six within the eoms all right, I'm not going to be asking like distinctly, so they're within the UMs. Is that clear? Extraocular movement. Okay, so today we're going to be learning cranial nerve number eight. One thing that I'm going to, okay, open your ears. Like one thing that I'm going to be telling you. So now, so the light, the light when I put the pupil on, uh, when, when I put the light on the pupil, so the light goes in and then goes to the brain with which, what nerve takes that there? Optic. So don't forget, two. Yeah, two takes it to the brain. And then what is the brain saying? Too much light, right? So what is the response? Close the pupil, close the window. So the ciliary body has to move to close the window. So then who does that? Three. Is that clear? So in other words, in the test, when I'm asking the respond, so who am I referring? Three. Three, Three is the response. So don't confuse that, okay? So obviously, the, uh, the motor is acting because a message went to the brain. And then the motor is the response of that the stimulus. Does that make sense? So when I'm telling you reaction, reaction is the response of the brain to that the stimulus. So read the question carefully. Am I making sense? Okay, very good. All right, so now, so this is cranial number eight is the or acoustic. All right, so it is a, this one is sensory also, so like uh, so we're gonna be all this uh, uh, the what's that the voices or the uh, sound waves they're gonna come from the environment they're gonna enter into the ear they're gonna go to the brain and then the brain is gonna translate and then so that's how we will know whether is it like a high pitch low pitch is it like a music is it like a scream is it the siren. So uh, that's, that's it. It's a cranial nerve number eight is sensory. It takes into the brain and the brain translates it. Is that okay? All right, very good. So now, so the ears, okay, so the, there are three parts of the ear, external ear, middle ear, and then also inner ear. All right, so well, this is a sensory organ, obviously. It is uh, identifying us, like uh, I, it is helping us to identify sounds. And then, um, okay. The other thing that the ear is responsible for equilibrium. All right, so the inner ear, the inner ear is responsible also for equilibrium. Okay, all right, so there is external ear, middle ear, and then the inner ear. All right, so now, um, So now let's start with the external ear. So we only can see the external ear. So like the auricle, touch your auricles, that's part of the external ear, all right? So it is like, it looks like a funny structure, but like it helps the sound to funnel in, all right? So that's why it is made. Like you're, you're wondering why is the structure of this ear? Like who, why do we have this kind of a structure? So because it funnels the sounds in, all right? So, so that we see the auricle, we can touch the auricle. So, okay, so it has to be smooth and it has to be, uh, you know, like it is flexible, it's not hard. And then so what the other thing that we're gonna be looking, so the, uh, the top of the auricle and then the outer inner canthus of the eye, it has to be on the same plate because if it is low, the auricle is low, that's, that, uh, that indicates Down syndrome. Okay, guys, so like, you know, you have to look where is the position of the auricle, so because it shows genetic disease otherwise. All right, so then there is the external ear, it's protective, it gathers and channels the sound. Okay. So now, we see the auricle, and then we see also something. 
All right, so before the middle ear. All right, so then what is what is also the external ear? The external ear, this is the auricle. And then from this hole, then there is inside the ear canal. The ear canal, and then you see the tympanic membrane. Okay. All right, so, okay, so middle ear is here. Okay, so do you see this is the, the auricle, and then there is the canal. All right, so the canal, you can see the canal, but like with the naked eye, you cannot see the canal. All right, so if we open the ear with your eye, can you see? No. What do you need? Otoscope. All right, so otoscope, it's, there is not machine in it. It's only light, all right? And then so you're putting the earpiece so that like it will fit here, all right? So it's only helping you to visualize this narrow canal because otherwise with your naked eye, you cannot see it. All right, so if you put the otoscope and then the earpiece and then insert the earpiece here to, let, to look this much of the structure, what kind of an inspection is that? Indirect. Why? Because you needed an instrument to look. Is that clear? So the otoscope, it's not, it's not doing anything. Like, you know, you, you see it, how is it made? It's like, it's a, it's, it has a handle and then it has a light. That's the only thing, like it's another kind of a pen light. It's, it's not something innovative. It's only a light, but like you're fitting the earpiece because like otherwise you cannot see it. Is that clear, guys? So how, what kind of an inspection is that? Indirect, why? Because you use a machine, not a machine, a tool to inspect. Is that clear, guys? So in other words, so the, or the external ear is the auricle and the canal. So in your, the canal, you're looking at with the earpiece and otoscope. And then so you can see all the way the tympanic membrane. All right, so the tympanic membrane is the gate to the middle ear. Is that clear? So that's all we can see. That's it. We can't see anything else. You can touch and then inspect and palpate the auricle. You can inspect the canal. You can see the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is where? The gate of the middle ear. Is this clear? So in the middle ear, like we have like the three um, uh, ossicles, which are the vibrating, flexible bones that help with the transfer of the sound waves. Is that clear? Is that clear, guys? So the inner ear, we have like three flexible, uh, small bones that like, you know, they vibrate and with their vibration, they transport the waves inside. That's all the middle ear does. Is that clear, guys? So the inner ear, who's in the inner ear? Cochlea, cochlea. Who is cochlea? Remember in the eye, who was the hub? The um, retina. Retina. So in the ear, the cochlea is the hub. Is that clear, guys? So the cochlea is the, in the inner ear, what does it do? It's a hub. So all the sounds that arrived from the uh, outer ear to the middle ear to the inner ear, it meets at the cochlea. Is that clear? So what does the cochlea do? It takes all these waves, sound waves and then sound impulses and then goes where? To the brain. And so what does the brain do? Translate it. Is this clear? Okay. All right, so now this is the external ear. We talked about it. Now the, we have the middle ear. So in the middle ear, where does the middle ear start? Starts with the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane, you see it with the otoscope, all right? So the tympanic membrane, so you see like, well, how do you see it? The tympanic membrane, if it's healthy, it will reflect a light. So in the, in the afternoon, we're gonna be learning to see like the reflection of that light. So if the, the, there is a reflection of the light, it means that the tympanic membrane was a healthy structure, it wasn't infected. So for instance, you're seeing the light reflex. Is that clear? So that's how you're gonna be assessing the health of the tympanic membrane. Okay. Then we have the ossicles, milius, incus, and the stapes. Milius, incus, and the stapes. So these are little bones, and then they're part of the inner ear. And then what are they doing? They're vibrating. When they vibrate, they transport or transfer the sound or it's that came from outside, and then they kind of move it towards the inner ear. All right, so middle ear functions, uh, TM separates middle from the external ear, ossicles transmit sounds from the TM to inner ear. I think I already said this. Okay. Remember, like, as we age, what happens to these ossicles? They're very fine bones, and then they're vibrating. They can be calcified. 
and then so like for that reason it doesn't vibrate as efficiently so for that reason elderly they're going to be having what hard of hearing and it's part of like developmental all right so for that reason press p cuses is hard of hearing due to age because of developmental changes nothing disease all right guys all right so all right, so now the inner ear, so inner ear structures are vestibules, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. So in other words, the most important the structure is the co cochlea. There are the, so the vestibules, semicircular canals, so these are like vestibules are helping with what? With the balancing, balancing. All right, so the cochlea, this is the cochlea, you see it here. All right, so what happens here? Uh, so the, the hub, all the sound waves come and congregate here, and then from here, cranial nerve number eight takes it where to the brain for translation. Cochlea translates out to cranial number eight. Semicircular canals are involved in vestibular function, movement, and balance. So, vestibules are responsible to what balance. Cochlea and then the semicircular canals, and cochlea is responsible for what congregating all the sound waves and then giving it to the cranial nerve number eight so that it can go to the brain for translation. Is this clear, guys? All right, so a lot of the time there are some medications, then uh, the side effect is what? Autotoxicity. Have you heard? Yes. I, did I say it in the farm class? No, I didn't say it. Farm. Not farm, the, not the farm, the medication from 2018. Did I say it? I I think it was like one of the side effects for our medication. Yeah, I, I did I say it with, with, because we do pick and throw, pick and the valley, mm -hmm. so that the, we, we don't want that antibiotic to be toxic level in the blood, because if it's toxic, it will come and then damage the cochlea. Is that clear? So that's the autotoxicity. Some medications, they are potent antibiotics, and then so, you know, so like, uh, you know, I, I did mean the pharma, pharmacology in 318. So remember like there was one graph like this. This is the therapeutic. All right, so and then this is the subtherapeutic. And then so this is toxic. So in other words, there are some medications where the level is always checked. Are you with me? So it, the, the, the medication level has to be here. If it's here, it's not doing anything. If it's here, it's gonna damage another organ. So we stop. Does that make sense? So I think I said it in the farm, not farm, like the pharmacology section after 318, that for that reason we check the blood right before we give the medication. And then after we gave the medication to check, like, you know, at the highest level of that medication that got just infused in my body, where is the level? Is that clear? If it's toxic level, we stop it. Because otherwise, like another organ is getting damaged. So what are we doing? We're fixing one thing with the destructing another thing. We don't want. Does that make sense, guys? So gentamicin is one of the medications, you know. So when I was a staff nurse at Parkland Memorial, so like the, we had, these patients had triple lumen. We, we drew the blood. We didn't even ask the phlebotomies to come. Does that mean, well, what is it, Jose, in practice? Are you doing pick and throw? Uh, for... Which medication are you doing? Vancomycin, you're doing it? Okay, so I remember when I was a staff nurse for the gentamicin, we used to do it. Okay, yeah, because it's a very potent medication, so you do pick and throw. So so what happens that uh, the, if this medication, they go to the, this toxic level here, the medication, it's gonna kill the cochlea. It's gonna kill the cochlea. Is that, it doesn't make sense, guys. So like in Armenia, so this, uh, they, they were in the villages, the kid has like this a fever, and then the mother is like holding the kid and then driving to the nearest clinic, like this is not the city, like it's uh, far in the villages. So they used to give gentamicin, and all these kids are getting, this is like 20 years ago. All right, so uh, what is it? So they, they, they're, they're getting deaf because the cochlea is damaged. And then what is your reasoning? Because like which is more important, life or the hearing? Both. Life and hearing, like why am I gonna make my like a, a very well uh, developed kid deaf in 21st century? Does that make sense? So for that reason, like why aren't you doing pick and throw because it's extra blood work. It's uh, extra money and it's additional blood work. So for that reason, like this is my friend that she has this project for the past 20 years. 
so that the so cochlear implant, all these kids that already their cochlea was damaged, they have implanted now so that they have regained the hearing. And now like the protocols have changed, and so the hearing is done at the time of birth, and then so if the, the gentamicin is given, they have to have a pick and throw. Or, and so like the whole protocol of the country got changed. Does that make sense? So obviously I, I don't think Armenia is distinct, like the, there, there are other countries in the world that are, uh, I, I don't think they're following pick and throw. Yeah, so the, the moral of the story, like one simple test can identify a quality of life and it's being like taken away from the kids. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, so uh, why did I say this? Because, because you have to be careful when you're giving this potent antibiotics because if it is on the toxic level of this medication, it is damaging another organ that cannot be reversed. Is that clear, guys? Okay, very good. Was it easy to understand the ear? Okay, so we're coming to the nose now. All right, so now the nose. So obviously when you're looking to the nose from outside, like you see an organ here. Okay, so it's only one nose. All right, so what else do you see? All right, so like, okay, so you see uh, 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 the, the, the septum. All right, so, and then obviously it's hard. It's like, um, what is this? It's like bone. And then you see two nares. Right? So like air is gonna come in. So when you're looking from outside, so the outside, the shape of the nose will tell you something. All right, so first things first, like you're gonna look if the septum is in the middle, all right? So the septum to be midline and it has to be straight, okay? So obviously like we're in a society that like always there is this rhinoplasty. People are doing uh, uh, for beautifying the kid, the, the kid, the, the nose. Uh, so for, they, for beautifying the nose, like there is plastic surgery, right? So anyway, so, um, yeah, so the septum has to be midline. Sometimes, you know, like the septum is deviated. A lot of time the, the children are playing and then they fall and then they're kind of the septum is fractured. And if right away, if it is not like uh, 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 fixed or stabilized, the, the body it will um, heal itself, but the septum can be deviated, all right? So like it can be a crooked septum. So uh, forget about the look, but like uh, physiologically, so because if the septum is not in midline, so uh, so the body thinks that, all right, if it's crooked, okay, so it's somebody who has entered. So it will, uh, it, it will translate as a foreign body. So what is it gonna do? It's gonna say, okay, let me secrete all this mucus because like, you know, with, the, with that secretion, maybe that foreign structure is gonna be flushed out. In reality, it's not foreign structure, it is like a crooked bone. Is that clear? So in other words, these kids, you know, like my brother was one of them. So like all the time, runny nose, runny nose, runny nose. Like it's so like, um, what's that? Uncomfortable situation. You're always looking for Kleenex, you know? So like, okay. So a lot of time you don't have Kleenex. You're a kid, what are you gonna do? You do this, you do this, right? Okay, because like it's all the time it's running, right? Okay, so what do you see these kids, you know, by doing this and this and, okay. So you find a crease here, like a little crease, little, you know, uh, line. So if you see little line here, so you know that this kid is like ongoingly, there is this drainage from the nose and then so obviously it's very unpleasant uh, state of uh, being to always have, hold the clinics and, you know, like who wants to do it? Like as if like you have to hold the bag of clinics with you. So they're gonna do this. So from outside, you can see like, where, why is this crease? Or so either there is a lot of allergies or there is a crooked something, a structure that the body is trying to flush it out for that reason, this, this drainage is coming. Is that clear? So for those people, rhinoplasty is must because it's not aesthetic anymore. It's like quality of life. All right, so like, you know, when he had it done, like, you know, it's, there was a like tremendous improvement as far as his breathing and then the drainage, you know, so like, so that is, it, it, it's not a plastic surgery anymore, it's medically necessary. Does that make sense, guys? So for that reason, like you see, the septum has to be midline and then the nares have to be not flared, okay? So if it's fanned and then flared, so what does that mean? It's so this patient is like having labored breathing ongoingly. COPD patients, you know, so, 
the, the ones that I uh, taught you in 318, remember I said you're using the sternocleidomastoid muscle, trapezius muscle, the abdominal muscle because the diaphragm was flattened. So when you're looking to these patients' faces, their nerves are flared out because like all they're doing is breathing. All they're doing 24 hours, they're breathing. So, and then they're wasting their muscle, the, the neck muscle, the sternocleidomastoid, trapezius, abdominal. On top of it, the nerve is flared out. It fanned, all right, so because it's labored breathing. So, it, so the, the, uh, just looking to the nose, it will tell you inside what's happening to that person's life. Does that make sense? So fanned, uh, uh, fan, flared nerves, it's COPD, difficulty of breathing, labored breathing, deviated septum, it will cause all this drainage ongoing because like the body's thinking that, okay, I'm producing all this mucus, I'm gonna flush that foreign body, and then so like the kid is doing this, 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 and there is a little line here. Is that clear, guys? Okay, so this is only inspection, and then you inspect it, and in your, in your head, you kind of made a lot of stories but that is pertinent to this patient's general health or the ENT health. All right, so, all right, so, so obviously, uh, so in the nose, what is there? The cranial nerve number one. What is one? Olfactory. What is olfactory? A smell. A smell. A smell. So a smell is also what? What kind of nerve? Sensory. So it takes the smell and it goes to the brain and it stops there. Is that clear? So in the lab, we're not gonna be doing the smell. All right, so, okay, so. But like when you're testing the smell, how are you gonna be testing it? When, okay, when do you test the smell? Only when the patient comes complaining. Are you, did, did you find this a common like in the past three years? COVID, because the COVID, what was it doing? It was irritating olfactory nerve and then the person's smell was being compromised. So it's a, like a naughty virus, it is like irritating. All right, so for that reason people came with, okay, I cannot smell. Before then, you know, like you, you hardly see people going to the provider and saying that, oh, I cannot smell. All right, so, so virus is one of the reasons it irritates the nerve and the, the, the nerve becomes inactive, yes? COVID was also irritating. Seven, right? Not tasting, very good, right? Yeah, the taste, the taste is gone, and then also the smell is gone. Okay, so, all right, so a person comes and says, okay, I'm, I don't smell, you know, I'm burning my food, and I cannot, I go to the uh, kitchen, surprise, surprise, like, oh, why, why can I uh, smell the burn so that I can intervene? So that, the, what are you gonna do? First things first, they have to be colored folded, I mean, blindfolded, not colored. <laughs> Blindfold. All right. So what does that mean? Because like, if you bring, okay, if you, if um, uh, 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 Paula tells me, okay, smell this. Okay, I can see like it is uh, coffee, and then there is no problem. Okay, so I will say, oh, I'm smelling coffee because it's not that probably I smell because I saw it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Automatically, the brain will think that you smell, but you really you didn't smell. So the moral of the story, the story. So if you're going to be presenting something for the patient to smell. The patient shouldn't see it. Does that make sense? If they're gonna see it, they're gonna tell you that, oh, I'm smelling coffee. Okay, so, oh, you're smelling coffee, but like, did you really smell it? So, so what should we do then? We have to uh, blindfold the patient, all right? So blindfold, first of all, blindfolding. Second of all, so what do you do? Like you close one nair and then say, smell it. And then the other nair and the smell. So you have to, uh, to assess one nair at a time. Is that clear, guys? And then so usually the, uh, the, the materials that we're gonna be using, it has to be pleasant. So it can be vanilla, it can be coffee. Is that clear? So, or lavender. So, but like not like alcohol, like don't open like the alcohol, the swab and then don't smell it. So, <laughs> or ammonia. So like those are like, it's gonna irritate. So. We're not gonna be doing in the lab, but like in practice also you're not gonna be doing it, but like at least you have to know like how you do it. Is that clear, guys? All right, so that's the cranial nerve number one, olfactory and it's only sensory. All right, so now like the nose, uh, we kind of looked to the nose from outside and then the structure of the nose gave us a, an idea about their like inner physiology of this patient. Do they have like a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Do they have allergies? Do they have a croup? Crooked septum secondary to injury, what, what is it? You know, so like it kind of, we got uh, uh, some information about that patient general health status. Okay, so now when the air is going in, so in, the, in, in there, so these are, we have little uh, needle hair. 
the, those hair is called cilia. All right, the cilia, what are, what are they uh, responsible to filter? So in other words, you can go like to a place that there is a lot of dust, right? So, and then so, oh, oh, like you're putting the mask, but be before you put the mask, okay, you already kind of breath the air. So like all that dust went inside. So the cilia is like a filter, it catches, it traps it. It doesn't let to go to the lungs. So for instance, like you have that dirt in your ear, ear, nose, okay, so that's, that's dirt. All right, so the cilia is good, you know, so one thing about the smoking, what does it do to cilia? It makes it sleep. It makes it sleep. So in other words, if somebody's a smoker, you know, so like your filtering ability is diminished. Is that clear? Because like you're making your cilia sleep. Okay. The other thing that you're gonna be helping this is like it it, it moistens, it, it moistens the air. Because if we don't have the nose, okay, so, and then so, if the nose is congested and you're breathing with the mouth, how is it? It's the mouth dries, so so um, in practice you're going to be seeing this patient. So the patients that are non-responsive, there is like brain injury, and then they're breathing. Like, they breathe like this, and then you go, you see their lips, their tongue, their teeth. It's all dry. So as a nursing care, we have to give extra mouth care to these patients. Okay, so because they're not they're not doing it on purpose, but because they have brain stem damage. And so like their mouth is open and their mouth breathes and everything is dry and then so the mouth smells also because we, uh, we, we learned it. And so the, the salivary glands, what are they important for? To make the mouth um, lubricated, otherwise uh, we're gonna be having dental caries. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. So that's extra nursing care. So cleaning the mouth like and then also that uh, sponges, you see that the sponges like you have to kind of uh, make it always uh, wet. Um, uh, um, Jose, are you doing glycerin uh, swaps for the mouth? Oh, no, no. Lemon no. swaps, because when I was a staff nurse, I used to do that. To do a... Uh, uh, to, like, to moisturize yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, like so a, you're still doing... And like then a so gel. And you put the gel on the top, yeah. uh, on the lips. And then sometimes you see the lips like dry. Don't peel it because like it's gonna, it, it's, it's gonna, it's, <laughs> it's gonna bleed. You know, so like if you see dry skin, you can with like a, a small scissors, you can cut it, but like don't peel it, please, because it will be it, it will be, it will make more painful. I mean, those are like all nursing functions. You don't need the doctor's order to do this. Like you have to do it because otherwise uh, it's gonna be more uh, uh, detrimental. You know, I had this patient, I still remember the link was the guy. I mean, at the St. Joseph uh, uh, rehab, second floor, and I remember the room also. And so, like this, this woman was very rich woman, you know. So, had married to a doctor in Beverly Hills, and then they had a diving act. They, they went to diving, and she had a diving expert. So mm -hmm. the brain wasn't uh, didn't get the oxygen, and so she was brain dead. Okay, so and so like when I was hired at St. Joseph in 1988, so like she was there already. And so, like, uh, it, uh, obviously, we were feeding her G tube, and so uh, with the G tube, she became she gained weight. The, the abdomen was uh, bloated. But the other thing is, like, the mouth. She was a mouth breather because the uh, so the brain stem was damaged. So, like, all the time. Like, so even if with the over the years, even if you do the mouth care and so the the lips and then the the, the teeth were all there's a lot of caries, and then it was smelling very bad, you know, so, and then, so like the, um, so, and so the, there was a the dentist consult, and the dentist said that she has, he has to pull all the teeth, the, the, the teeth has to be pulled. Luckily by then, the ch her children, they were grown up, and then, so they went to court and told the judge that, you know, like our mother wasn't, wouldn't have liked to live like this. Okay, so you can see on the picture, I mean, I, I, I never saw her when she was there. Beautiful, elegant woman, you know, like, hair is like, well oh, done, you know, so. And then you, you look to that picture and you look to the patient, you know, over time. This was like years after years. And then till the kids were like young, they became adults. They went to court and then the husband was the second husband. For the reason, I think she, he didn't have the authority to make that decision. I don't know, I don't remember the details now. So, but the children went to court and said that, you know, our mother didn't want to live like this. 
for how many years? And then so the judge gave the order that we're not going to be feeding her anymore. So we stopped feeding her from the G tube, and then eventually she died that way. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I you know go I mean I'll pull all the teeth. I mean she's she she can't even sit. You know, so who's going to come and then pull the teeth? And it's very traumatic. Like what are we doing really? So this is like, um, I mean, I was, uh, I was, I was novice myself, you know, I was only two years uh, grad. I mean, I didn't know much either. So, uh, I mean, I was doing well, past whatever my superiors were telling me. I didn't have much of uh, nursing knowledge either. I mean, I had the knowledge, but like the experience, but like I followed instructions. So, so whatever it's in my head, I'm just sharing it with you that, you know, mouth breathers, the teeth becomes decayed, decayed. And then, so if they're gonna be living, there's no DNR, so, I mean, what is the other thing, like pulling the teeth? Okay, so this is just like, it just came to my head. All right, okay, anyway. Okay, all right, so nose, nasopharynx, and sinuses. All right, so then, what do we have here? Uh, we talked about, I already said about this, already I said about this, okay. So uh, the thing that you're gonna learn, we're gonna be looking, the thing that we're gonna be looking, the, the turbinate. So like this is the nerve, or it's, this is the septum, this is the wall. The wall, this is the septum. So if this is the septum here, there is a wall here, like this side, touching the septum. That wall is called the turbinates. Is that clear? So you see the middle term and inferior turbinates. All right, so the turbinates, the turbinates have to be beefy red, you know, so beefy red, and it needs to be, it, it needs to be a good structure there, but like when the person is congested, the turbinates swell. And then you can say the turbinates are boggy. Boggy means that it's swollen, all right? So what makes it uh, boggy when there is a congestion? And then the other thing is the color has to be beefy red, like a meat, the meat, like a steak meat. Like that's how, how the color should be. Sometimes like you look to the turbinates, they are pale and they are pink. And then so there is a correlation, somebody who has allergies, like you know, uh, allergic rhinitis, their turbinates are pink. All right, so pink, pale, like a white, white pink. Whitish pink, pale. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So, all right, so that's, I mean, the color change. I don't know what is the correlation, why the allergens are making the color change. But like every time, like when I did the annual physicals, and then I can see it, the pale turbinates, and I ask, do you have allergic rhinitis? Sure enough, they do. All right, so like you can kind of, you look to the color, you can ask the patient. Does that make sense? So, and uh, so, and also, what is the color normally? Beefy red, like the steak meat, like just think from that perspective. And then so, if it is a swollen, because there is congestion. Is that clear? Okay. All right, so we've already talked about this. Oh, and then one thing about this, okay, so when you're doing the ear, all right, so this is gonna be in the lab, I'm gonna be showing you. So when you're holding, so this is your otoscope. Your, okay, so this is your otoscope. Yeah, this is your otoscope, right? So this is the head here, like there is like a funny head here. It's only a light, I mean, it, it's nothing sophisticated. It just looks like a pen light. You hold it like this, look how you hold it. You're gonna hold it like this, is that clear? Mm -hmm. So this is your otoscope, you hold it like this. All right, so the handle has to be like this, okay? And then so this is that, that funny structure here, okay? So that it has like this tip that we put the earpiece and then we're looking, okay, it'll pull a come. So when, when you're doing this, okay, so when you're gonna be doing the ear, okay, so you're gonna pull up and out. Up and out, is that clear? So oracle has to be held up, up and out. All right, and then you hold it like this. Am I making sense? Okay, did everybody see this? Because it's an important technique, guys, all right? So this is your otoscope, this is the handle. This is the funny edge of the otoscope, right? All right, so there is this, you're gonna be putting the earpiece here. So you hold up and out. Is this clear? It looks like you're going back. Yeah, out, 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 backwards, out. Back, okay. 
Okay. Back I would up. Be this ah, way. okay. I'm pulling. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Out is like I'm kind of ah, uh, like no. We're not gonna. Pull. We're not gonna. We're not gonna um, detach the oracle from you. <laughs> so, so up, back. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So up and back. And then how are you holding it? Look. You're holding it like this, guys, okay? And so it has to be like this, horizontal. Did everybody see it? We're practicing this in the lab today, all right? So I go inside like this and I'm looking. <laughs> is that clear? So that's how it's gonna be. What is this inspection called? Indirect. Indirect, why? Because, because I needed a tool. You know, like this tool is not a sophisticated tool. It's only light, that's all. And then so like it has like that a structure there, like a triangular so that the earpiece can fit so that I can go in there. Is that clear? So it is indirect, indirect inspection. So if I'm using glasses to look like the hair or like the, the skull, is this indirect? No. 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 The glasses are not tools. They're part of my eyes. Is that clear? So glasses are not considered indirect. Glasses are considered direct because without it, I cannot see that. Like it's kind of, it's sewn to my eyes. Think that way. Is that clear? Very good. Thank you, Fola. Let's give Fola a hand. <laughs> Very good. Okay, now, once I take this out, all right, so I don't throw that earpiece away, all right? So I go and then, and, you know, I put the earpiece in the, to the, ear, to the nose, and the where do I put it? Like the earpiece, it touches this side of the nose. You know why? You don't put it to the turbinate. Turbinate has a lot of nerve endings. And then the person is gonna do this, and then you're gonna feel like, okay, what did I do to hurt him or her? Is that clear? But like if you put this side, you know, like here, this side, like here, this meat here, this side. Mm -hmm. And then so like you put the earpiece touches here, still there is gonna be light. But like the patient is not gonna complain because it's not as sensitive here. But don't put it to the septum. <laughs> Because septum has a lot of nerve endings there, and it's going to be uncomfortable, and they're going to push you away. And then, like you know, as a provider, imagine patient pushing you away. It's not very good. Is that clear, guys? So we're going to practice that. Okay. So and so that's that. We learned about this, this much about the nose. All right, so then oh, you want to take a break, it's nine o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Go take, well, how many uh, minutes I gave you? 15? 15? Okay. 15 minutes. 15 minutes break. I'm going to go get coffee because, like, I'm going to. Doesn't my energy is going down? Okay. All right, so it's good. Thank you.